In pioneering commercial air routes of the world, mail planes have had to face and overcome incredible odds. Black nights, blinding storms, treacherous wind currents. These have been the airmen's constant foes. And then in landing, the greatest peril of all, high tension wires. Invisible to the pilot as he glides down, maybe uncertain of his exact location. men have cheerfully faced these dangerous odds in their final conquest of the last sphere to be conquered, that of the air. In the war's latest aeroplane, science has come to the pilot's rescue with instruments that automatically give him a sixth, seventh and eighth sense, as it were. In the cockpit, he views the instrument board that tells him of conditions he can't see or feel himself, indicating the slightest rise or fall in flight or the least turn from side to side, the perfected compass to guide and height above sea level, a known quantity. One of the world's greatest authorities on aerial navigation and aerodrome development is Mr. Harold Gatti, the Tasmanian, whose name is a household word in American aviation circles. I'm glad steps are being considered for the establishment of adequate airports along the main routes of this country. These changes do not have to be of an experimental nature. There's already, on, in other countries, efficient systems have been established which only need adapting to Australian conditions. The following pictures will give you an idea of what a modern airport looks like and how the safety of flying has been increased by the provision of such facilities on many overseas lines of aerial communication. The control station of a modern airport is just as important to flyers as the control tower of a battleship is to the gun crews it directs. Inside the aerial control station, we find the directing brain in wireless touch with all machines in the vicinity, bringing in one and sending off another with the precision of a railway signalman in his signal box. This is the way a departing plane is signaled to go, and with the tarmac clear, the airliner is off on some transcontinental journey. Variations in the direction and volume of the wind are naturally of very vital interest to airmen, and changes are automatically shown on these instruments inside the control room. Here also a map shows each main aerial route and the lights indicate the positions of planes in flight or at aerodromes on their way along them. Probably the greatest aid that science has given airmen is directional wireless. In the thickest of weather, beacon rays shoot off from this tower guiding the pilot safely home. Let's see how it works. A simple mechanical signaling device spells out the most letters required, repeating these R by R. And all planes tuning in are able to head for this welcome sound and safety. On approaching the drone, the powerful searchlight can be seen, piercing the thick storm. At such a typical intermediate port, the plane can land to await better weather or proceed on its journey, according to instructions received from headquarters. Compare this safe descent with the tragedy that might have been, had not modern aerodrome facilities brought the mailed plane to a haven of safety. And how does Australia stand in these matters? The minister in charge of 1938 celebrations propounds an idea, the Honourable J. M. Dunningham. It is pleasing to learn that the federal government has decided to erect an administrative building at Mascot and to name this aerial terminal the Kingsford Smith Aerodrome in memory of Australia's great aviator. What a fitting climax it would be to make this new centre into a modern airport the opening of which would synchronize with the 1938 celebrations of the 150th anniversary of the foundation of Australia. Visualize such a scheme for a minute. The first thing it would bring would be improved access to the airport from business centers. At present, transit on the congested and drab routes from the city to Mascot takes almost as long as the flight to Newcastle itself. Sydney should have a boulevard along which uninterrupted access would be possible. Car speed to the aerodrome is almost as important as aeroplane speed from it. The other great changes would be those visible at the aerodrome itself. From the simple field at Mascot, which has seen so much of Australia's aviation history in the making, would rise the Kingsford Smith Airport, beautiful and spacious, such as Gatwick, London's latest aerial terminus. And this would fittingly be the first of the Commonwealth memorials to her intrepid line of aerial pioneers who have passed on.
commemoration of the 50th anniversary of Australia's first airmail flight. State Governor Sir Eric Woodward sees a Victor Air Tourer complete a reenactment of the flight from Melbourne to Sydney. A huge Boeing 707 wheels in at the same time. Pilot Walton, dressed in the manner of the pioneer French aviator Maurice Guillot, carries special greetings from Melbourne's Lord Mayor. The original flight, lasting two and a half days, was made in this flimsy Blériot monoplane, which carried Guillot and two and a half thousand items of mail. A movie tone flashback recalls the famous Southern Cross and its part in the development of air mail. In the early 30s, several flights between England and Australia were undertaken, and in those days, Smithy always received a hero's welcome. Meantime, within Australia and its territories, a comprehensive airmail network was developing, in later years to become the subject of study by postal administration abroad. Then, in 1938, the official inauguration of regular overseas services. Captain Lester Brain receives mail for His Majesty King George. Acting Governor-General Lord Huntingfield cuts the ribbon. The flying boat reached Britain nine days later. A familiar figure takes part in the first airmail flight to New Guinea. Then Minister for External Affairs, Billy Hughes, forecast the new air link as a valuable adjunct to defence. And then, promptly went along. The de Havilland took off from a very different archer field to the Brisbane airport we know today. The services to New Guinea were typical of tremendous advances made on the Commonwealth's internal air routes. It is a tribute to Maurice Guillot that today hundreds of airmail services carry more than 325 million postal articles every year. October 1970, and for the first time Australia sees the giant 747s, clipper ships of the future. The progression from sleek 707s to the jumbos is a massive one, and comes appropriately just half a century after commercial aviation started in Australia in 1920. In those days, aviation carried much of the glamour and amazed half-belief that goes with today's adventures into deep space. The unforgettable Smithy and his Southern Cross kick the pioneer Australian industry into the 30s, when aircraft like the free-engine Stinson win the confidence of early air travellers. 1934 sees the advent of the DC-2, the first all-metal commercial airliner to fly in Australia, and the forerunner of the DC-3, destined for a long and reliable life and called the workhorse of the sky. In the mid-1930s, Qantas uses the DH-86 to fly the Empire Air Route between Sydney and Singapore, and soon after, the flying boats expand the link with a service between Australia and the United Kingdom. Aviation begins to boom in the late 30s, and KLM becomes the first overseas airline to fly to Australia. World War II temporarily halts progress, but later brings its own compensations with advanced aircraft like the Lancaster Bomber, converted to civilian use. Now the airlines have the space to add a few extra comforts for the new breed of international traveller, like these sleeperettes on the DC-6 Pacific run. Sleek and swift, the Constellation is chosen to carry the Qantas flag in 1947 when the Australian airline cuts its direct ties with BOAZ. In 1959, the Comet heralds the advent of international jet flights to and from Australia and New Zealand, while the Fokker Friendship turbojets prove themselves on the shorter cross-country hauls. The 1960s see interstate air travel taken over by the fan jets, Boeing's 727s. Added to the domestic fleets, DC-9s from Douglas. Now it's possible to fly from Melbourne to Sydney in less than an hour. Into the 70s, and the 707 brings Australia closer to the rest of the world. But with the advent of the Jumbos, the 707 may be the last of their line. Now we have the big ones, the massive people movers that bring a new era to aviation.